Happy Easter. Happy Easter. That's God's gift to us all this morning. Found out that he would be able, Jason would be able to play for, Joshua would be able to play for us this morning uh, just last night. So I'm so grateful for God's spontaneous gift to us as a congregation. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Lord God, we thank you for your goodness and kindness this morning and we celebrate your love. We celebrate the love of God who for the joy that was in his heart sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We pray, Lord God, for your Holy Spirit to guide us as we feel our way along as if we were learning a new language with our fingertips. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to hear your still small voice. We pray, Lord God, for a spirit of fellowship, and we pray, Lord God, that you would help us to put our burdens down, let you carry them. We pray, Lord, for forgiveness. We pray for healing. We pray for joy. We pray for laughter. We pray, Lord God, for your presence being manifest here among us today. We thank you so much for this glorious day in Sonoma, California. 181 Chase Street. Lord, we pray that your presence would be felt deep in our hearts. Understand and follow what you are wanting to say to us. Lord, encourage us. Strengthen us deeply in our bones. Lord, help us to hear what you are saying and then go out and share your message with others. Thank you. Lord God, for being here and fulfilling your promises to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For those of you who are visiting, my name is Henrik Mann. I have the privilege of being the pastor of this church now for almost five years. And we are so thrilled to have you here today. Um, for those of you who had a chance to eat a little bit of our breakfast, it was wonderful. Thank you to all the ladies and gentlemen who helped make that wonderful breakfast possible this morning. It's not a surprise that God is in the business of answering prayers. In John chapter 14, verse 13, it says this, Whatever you shall ask in my name, whatever, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so we see our prayer as Christians being reflected in the context of the relationship that God the Father has with God the Son. And so when we pray in alignment with what God the Father and the, God the Son share as, as part of the Holy Trinity, our prayers become answered because God has a way of delighting to fulfill what is on the heart of his son. And in the same way this morning, we want to invite God to be pleased. It is an audience of one. It is him who we worship and who we praise. And it is his presence that we want to invite to come into this service and into our hearts and into our minds to refresh us from what has, has been part of our life's journey and to help us have hope for what lies ahead. I'd like to invite my lovely wife, Charlotte, to come forward with me and join me as we uh, sing a song that is going to uh, hopefully invite the Holy Spirit, invite God to be here among us. Uh, Joshua learned this song just a few minutes ago. <laughs> and so um, uh, he, may be, he may be a master in... Uh, Beethoven and Brahms and Mozart and uh, Tchaikovsky uh, and Bach. Okay, thank you for not letting off, off, Bach off the hook. Um, but uh, uh, this is a little different genre for him, and we're just so grateful uh, that he is uh, the kind of person who pushed through to learn this song uh, with us just this morning. So I'd like to invite you to stand. You don't have to sing, but I want to invite you to at least speak the words with your heart. Uh, you're welcome to join with us, but we're just going to let God lead us as we go through this song, having not practiced it much at all. Okay, let's, 
Give God the glory. comfortable with that. I'd like to invite Elizabeth and Emmy to come forward and join us. Uh, we're going to sing uh, some songs, some congregational songs to the glory of the Lord to God. And I want to invite us to sing Christ the Lord is risen today. It's a standard in churches all over the world. And I think you'll be able to follow along with us as the Lord leads and as these ladies lead. So would you please take center stage, the ladies of Sonoma, would you please welcome them. So now what's gonna happen is that Olga, who was our regular pianist, is going to play by recording. She's not here with us, um, and uh, Joshua's not gonna pretend to play these songs. Uh, but I do wanna invite you to sing as, 
as strongly as you can as we uh, give God the glory. Would you please do that?
fear is gone because I know I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day sing one more song you are beautiful uh, it's called I stand in awe of him you, you are beautiful, beautiful beyond description, description to marvelous for words to wonderful for comprehension like nothing ever seen or heard who can grasp your infinite wisdom who can fathom the depth of your love you are beautiful beyond description majesty Yeah. 
invite Joshua to play some special music for us just so that our hearts might be caught up in the Holy Spirit's presence here today and prepare us for the word. Joshua. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave you. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. 
and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you see that picture that's on the screen before you this morning, that's an actual doorway from the city of Philadelphia, the ruins of Philadelphia in modern day Turkey. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. If you don't have one with you, it should be the there should be a Bible in the pew rack in front of you, and you can find it in the last chapter, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelations. We've been going through the book of Revelations, um, and we've been hearing what the risen Lord Jesus has to say to the different churches, and we're on church number six. Church number six is the Church of Philadelphia and we thought we wouldn't break the, uh, the pattern of following on these churches because the Church of Philadelphia is a church that uh, would be a good church to aspire to. It's a church that Jesus doesn't criticize, he does encourage, he does strengthen them, he does uh, give them guidance and wisdom and promise. And uh, as all smaller churches need, we need the hear, the, wo- the voice, the love, the grace of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. We celebrate that Jesus is alive from the grave today on Easter Sunday. But He isn't just standing there alive like uh, some curiosity in an amusement park. He is speaking to the people who make up the um, body of Christ, the people of God on earth. He is still speaking this very day. Lord God, I pray that the meditations of my heart and our hearts and the words that come from my lips might, might glorify you and speak to the needful moment, the teachable moment this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, there are one of many, there is one of many items that are in common between the ancient people and the ancient world and the postmodern world that we live in and it is the physical and ideational presence of open and closed doors today you walked into this church and hopefully you did not find it difficult to go through the door and to find your way into this sanctuary there are all sorts of magnificent doors that have been created by the genius of human beings, by craftsmanship. And one of the more amazing doors that I found an image of is this, is this door in the Middle East. My wife and I have in our home several pictures that were taken by my wife's father-in-law of doors. One is the Sultan's door. And then there's another door in Gorham, Turkey. And And these doors are just magnificent in terms of how they are built and constructed. You know, we here in America, when we think of doors, we usually think of very plain, very maybe cheap made doors, doors that don't seem to uh, even keep the wind out, let alone keep anybody else out. And, um, And I have to say, I don't think we're typically proud of the doors that we have here in America. But I gotta tell you, those doors are some of the more magnificent doors I've ever seen. And if I knew how they would be made or if there was some shop that was able to make those doors for my house, I would say, let's build those doors. Let's have those doors. They're magnificent. But you know what? It's not about the pride in the door. It's about the functionality of the door, isn't it? The doors that come into our lives where for a moment in time, we can either go through that door or we can not go through that door. God brings us doors for our lives. 
And those doors are doors that we can struggle with, especially when they seem to be closed doors or when multiple doors seem to be open. And we as a young person don't know whether we should go through this door or that door. Doors are a challenge. The Egyptians, the Egyptians understood doorways. Uh, this is a doorway on one of the pyramids of Egypt. And if you notice on the sides of the door, there is this sign of modern medicine that goes all the way back to the ancient pyramids of a snake being hung on a pole. And it is a sign of the, the God of health, the God of medicine. And it's interesting that Moses lifted up a snake when he was leaving Egypt. That was already a sign of their culture and it was on their doors. It was a, it was a way in which people invoked the gods to come and be part of the experience of going in and out of doors. So they put their gods right on the side of the doors that, that they had. And, and we see this here. And uh, modern day medicine, if you look at uh, many of the medical advertisements here in the 21st century, you will see still a snake hanging on a pole. And it goes also back to Moses who lifted up a snake in the desert because people had been bitten by snakes. And he said, if you look by faith up, you will be healed. And those who do not look by faith up, you won't be healed. And Jesus and, and the, the beauty of the Holy Spirit is that, is that the Holy Spirit took that symbol and then had us see it again in Jesus being lifted on the cross. And so Jesus hanging on the cross is a symbol as well as a reality and a historical uh, fact that, that anchors our faith in Jesus Christ. And that fact is that when Jesus is lifted up, we find healing for our souls. When Jesus is lifted up, we find our place. When Jesus is lifted up, we know the doors that we should be walking through with our lives. If you go into the pyramids, the pyramids were designed to have doors, but then to keep everybody out for all of eternity. Those doors were booby-trapped. Those doors had, had huge 20-ton blocks of of not concrete, because they didn't have concrete, but of stone that were engineered so that after the Pharaoh's body and his servants were, were entombed, then the, the blocks would come down so that nobody would raid Pharaoh of all the things he wanted to take into the afterlife. My friends, the whole of Egyptian culture was based on preparation for the afterlife. And so many times in these modern days, people wonder, well, you know, what are you talking about? How can, how can anybody spend their life preparing to die? Well, Christians have the answer to that. And the answer is this. Jesus is the doorway from this life into eternal life. Jesus is the doorway that the Egyptians were searching for and never found. As we think about doors, we realize that not every open door is a good door. There are all sorts of open doors on the internet. In fact, when my computer is on, people in Russia or in China might be uh, tempted to go through the electronic open door of my computer and steal my information. And I don't want people to steal the information in my computer, but these are the types of things that happen, don't they? Maybe it's happened to you that somebody has hacked into your computer. Not every open door is a good door. I don't want my door to be open to everyone and everything in the whole world. But I do want to be able to walk through the door that Jesus calls me to walk through. 
Jesus said this in verse 8, I know your deeds. What he opens, and he said this, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And so churches have open doors as well. Churches have open doors and sometimes they have closed doors. It seems that the physical door of churches may be open, but the fellowship door that's in the heart of the people may be closed. It may be insulated. It may be not hospitable to people coming in to be part of the fellowship. You see, many churches, unfortunately, because they're swayed by the people who have worldliness in their hearts, who have not yet fully come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they have a closed sense of fellowship and of leadership. So the leadership circles are never open. They just play musical chairs around the leadership circle. And then there's fellowship circles. Is there room for one more person to sit down and eat at the meal? Some churches will say, yes, we'll get another table out. We'll make room. We'll get another chair out. And other churches will say, look, you snooze, you lose. You're not part of our church, so it doesn't really matter that you don't get a meal this morning. My friends, I want to let you know that to the best of my wife's and my ability, despite the challenges of the pandemic, we have tried to keep the doors of this church open. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have struggled. We have been in difficulty and travail when the governor of our state tells us to shut the door. If it wouldn't have been for Susie Perry there and, and a cell phone and us sitting here with the cell phone and starting to do uh, camera work so that now we want to welcome all those who will watch on the internet uh, today or in the week ahead. Uh, we could open the door of our church through the means of modern technology so that people could watch what was going on here, even if we had no piano, even if we had uh, nothing else, no bulletins, no people in, the, uh, in here, and yet we brought music and we brought the love of God. And my friends, um, it's still as simple as that. We don't have our pianist this morning. Unfortunately, Olga is a beloved person in our church. But uh, you know what? It doesn't stop us from singing and praising God. And God brought us the gift of Joshua this morning. I just praise God that at the last minute, God steps up. I woke up this morning and said, Charlotte, happy Easter. I need to apologize to God because for weeks I've been stressing about this. And I should have had faith that God was going to step in with somebody to be playing the piano. And Joshua shows up, and it's like a miracle. Like, an, like he just walks through the door of our church and steps up and brings joy and brings excellence. Amen? Amen. So he found the right door. He could have gotten lost this morning, but he showed up. Because God had an agenda and an and a, a assignment for him this morning. Now, there's an interesting quote from Alexander Graham Bell about doors. You know Alexander Graham Bell, one of the great inventors in America. He had this to say, despite him being an agnostic. He said, when one door closes, another opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one which has opened for us. Now, how could he be an agnostic? When God opened doors for him, opened his mind to create and invent all sorts of things, including the light bulb, if I read it. Is that right or was that Thomas Edison? Okay. He, oh, Alexander Graham Bell is the, is the telephone guy. Okay. Thank you for educating me. I didn't research it. But I know he's an inventor. 
And I know that uh, he's affected our lives because we all are on our phones still to this very day. Uh, but guess what he says up there? When one door closes, another opens. How can you believe that if you don't have faith in God? How can you believe that God will open another door or a window? Do you remember the sound of music and Maria having a closed door with regards to one part of her life? And then the mother of the, of the um, convent says, Maria, you know, when God closes the door, He opens a window. He opens a window. Well, I prefer that He opens a door because I can't get through windows so well. Okay? But the bottom line here is that God opens new pathways. And Alexander is right about this, that when we look so long and so regretfully at the closed door, and we, we want to knock it down, we want to uh, rail against God that the door is closed, but there may be things behind that door that are not good for us, and we can't see it. And God has other doors for us. So how does God guide us? God guides us to open doors, and then we have to pray and seek His face. Is this the door you want me to go through? And this morning, Jesus is saying that He wants to give a door of evangelistic opportunity to a little church that is doing all the right things except advancing. Except advancing. We can be proud of the loving atmosphere here at our church we can be proud of the hospitality but are we advancing in sonoma california the gospel and the kingdom of god <coughs> it's a good question you know we can <coughs> we can follow the example of many churches that seem to be doing the right things but for some reason they're not catching fire with the love of God. And so we need to be praying. We need to be on our knees because being on our knees and praying is part of discerning the open doors that God has for us. The church of Philadelphia is the sixth church that we've looked at. There's Ephesus. They lost their first love. There's Smyrna that was caught up in false doctrine. There's Pergamos who... Uh, was doing okay, sort of. It was a mixed report. Thyatira was struggling with, uh, with not hardly anything good that Jesus said to them. And Sardis. And then there's Philadelphia. We have a city in America called Philadelphia. And last night I was looking at the words of Bruce Springsteen's song about Philadelphia. It's a song about homelessness. And it's a song about not being able to know yourself when you're looking in the mirror because you've lost all this weight and because you've lost hope and because you are discouraged. It is one of the great songs of American culture that Bruce Springsteen wrote and sang and it still echoes in the hearts of the generations that are alive right now. You can go and find it on, your, on the internet. Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love. We all know that. But if you go to the city of Philadelphia, you'll see some tough streets. You'll be reminded of, of Sylvester Stallone and, and uh, the whole Rocky series and, and the grittiness and the difficulty of living in Philadelphia. Some of the best people in the world live in Philadelphia. But it's tough, tough times. And so the little church of Philadelphia in Asia Minor also was a little church that was struggling in an environment that was difficult, that was politically against the agenda of Christianity, that was filled with Jewish people who had chased Christians down from Jerusalem and was slandering them and was attacking them and was, was bound and determined, no matter what, to shut down that church. And sometimes it feels when we are loving the, the fellowship of little churches like every, the whole world is against us. And it was the same way with Philadelphia. But Jesus says, I have an open door. 
Go from defense to offense. Move from just hiding in the walls of the church to being out there in the streets and loving people with, with the love and the strength that I'm going to give you as you are engaged in mission. Dallas Willard says this, God may not guide us in an obvious way because He wants us to make decisions based on faith and character. Sometimes we are motivated just to look for an absolutely sure and exact sign of words about whether we will go through this door or that door. And Dallas is catching the spirit of God's guidance, which is that I don't always tell you everything in detail because I want you to grow up in maturity and in faith. That if you can put all your effort into seeking the glory of God first, then whatever door you go through, it's going to be okay because God is going with you through that door. You see, God knows what's on the other side of the doors of our lives. When I came here with Charlotte five years ago, we didn't know, we didn't anticipate a pandemic or a post-pandemic environment. The church started to grow. Within nine months, we were really having some momentum. And then, boom, the curtain came down called the pandemic. And we were not allowed to meet. And everybody was afraid in America to meet with anybody. It was horrible, horrible. But God has kept the doors open of our church. We are sitting in an opportunity of miracle this morning together. Amen? Amen. And so as we think about faith and character, that's why we have the doors open because the people who are part of this church have faith and they have character. Now, they're not perfect, but mind you, they have faith and character. They've kept the doors open and I'm so grateful. I'm so proud. I'm so thankful and privileged to be the pastor of this church. Amen? Amen. So when I think about Philadelphia, this is part of all that's left. There's an amphitheater there. There are ruins there. But the church is gone. And maybe someday, that'll all be what's here. Just ruins. Or, or who knows? Maybe it'll be condos for homeless people. I, I don't know what will be here in uh, decades ahead, but I do know this. The fellowship of the church of Philadelphia was written into the scriptures for millions and millions of people to read about for 2,000 years. And so the testimony of the church of Philadelphia still rings out in this very day of the risen Christ speaking to a people who he did not criticize, but he said, I want to strengthen your love for people who don't know me yet. And so as we think about this, we realize that there's going to be opposition. And Paul said this about the Jewish challenge. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, though whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now that's in the King James. I couldn't find an NIV version of this verse for a slide. But why do I bring this slide to your attention? Because there are people in this day and age who think that all Jews are of Satan because of this verse. And because of the verse in Revelation, it's not the case. Paul argued, look, we're all Jews and we're all Gentiles depending on the state of our hearts and our faith in God. So when we look now at the modern news of Israel, remove from your mind the context of a nation and think just of who are Jews by faith. And who are not people of God because they are not living by faith? That's how Paul the Apostle handled the challenge of Jewish um, exclusion. 
we are Jews, you guys are all Gentiles. Well, Paul said, look, I'm a Jew of Jews. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I am the epitome of being a good Jew. But I have learned it's not about pride in being Jewish. It's about walking in faith and love with God. And so those who are real Jews are those who walk in faith and love with God. And that can be a Jew or a Gentile. It's amazing how Paul said, in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. He said that. And so Paul is saying, turn your enemy into an opportunity. If there is somebody who's resisting the love of God, make it an opportunity to pray for them. Make it an opportunity to share the love of God. Don't allow them to win the day. James 1.12 says this, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because he has stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. So this little church was persevering under trial. They had all sorts of persecution taking place. Slander and all manner of resistance. And Jesus says, take the offensive. Take the offense. Go out and, and love the people of the city of Philadelphia. Don't let it be a place of spiritual desolation and darkness. My friends, does Sonoma matter to God? If Sonoma matters to God, then we'll be out there with the love of God. And so we have now gathered 335 units of blood in the past two years to help save lives in the hospitals of Sonoma. We have put together a live nativity two years in a row, and 150 people come out each year to see the camels and to see the children and to see the whole display. And I am most proud of the shoebox ministry of this church. There are churches of thousands, thousands that cannot get to the level of shoeboxes that this shoebox that this church generates. 395 boxes of love went to children around the world this past November. They were all stacked up here, I don't know what, 10 feet high? It was incredible to the glory of God because our church is persevering under the challenges that we face. And there was a missionary, Christine Harrison, long before I came here, who was touched by God and she ministers to 90,000 people in the world's largest refugee camp in Uganda. And she comes here and she reports how she's ministering to the women of that camp and how every one of the 90,000 has seen the Jesus film and how God is transforming their lives as they learn small business venture. It's amazing what God is doing in, Ugand in that Uganda refugee camp because one lady in our church heard the voice of God and said, I'm going to move out. I'm going to advance. I'm going to see what I can do with my hand in the hand of the living God. And so I'm reminded that until God opens the, door, the next door of our lives, praise Him in the hallway. Amen? Praise Him in the hallway. If you don't have wisdom from God yet for what's the next stage of your life, then praise Him until He does tell you what it is He wants you to do for your next assignment. Praise Him. Give Him glory. Tell Him thank you that you know better the timing for my life and that you're giving me a pause signal so that I don't go through the wrong door or that I jump prematurely in through the door that I shouldn't should go through but not yet and I'm also reminded of what Paul said when he wrote the the letter to the Romans for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jew then to the Gentile it gives salvation to everyone amen amen and so Jesus concludes this thinking about the door in verse 20 by reversing it 
and saying, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. What door is that? It's the door of your and my heart. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with that person and they with me. My friends, is your heart open to the knocking of Jesus Christ saying, hello, I'm not going to beat the door down, but I'm going to be polite and I'm going to knock and I'm going to keep knocking until I absolutely know that you don't want me to come in and fellowship with you. My friends, is the door of your heart open to fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus this very day? Our faith says that He's alive. And what Jesus is doing is He's knocking at the door of many people's lives. C.S. Lewis said this, the Son of God became a man so He could enable men to become sons of God. Isn't that true? God loves us enough to have His Son knocking at the door of our church, knocking at the door of our hearts, knocking at the door of Sonoma, knocking at the door of our lives. And so I want to close this song, this time, by singing this song and have you sing it with me. And we're not going to have music, but we're going to sing it anyway. And the ladies can come and join me. And we're just going to sing this song as kind of a closing song together. It's called My Tribute. I believe it's from Andre Crouch. And it's a thank you to God for what He does in our lives when we experience His good grace. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all.
I believe in God the Father, Jesus the Son of God and man, and the Holy Spirit according to the Bible, God's only and final written word.